Good evening, and it's with great pleasure that I welcome the Vice President of the Blake Society, Dr. Kerry Davis. Kerry is an independent scholar and has contributed some remarkable discoveries to the Blake community. Perhaps the most, one which touches me most is the discovery of the Moravian connection through Blake's mother. This evening, Kerry is going to talk to us under the title, which is a quotation from a letter from Catherine the Great of Russia. Inoculation should be common everywhere. And so let me hand over to our guest speaker for this evening, Dr. Kerry Davis. Good evening. Um, if then we could have the, well, for us. Yeah, inoculation should be come up everywhere. Catherine the Second, Empress of all the Russias, otherwise Catherine the Great. So if we have our first slide, please. Yeah. Just over a month ago, on 1st of December, in fact, 2021, McDougal Arts of St. James's Square held one of their regular sales of Russian works of art, including the auction as lot. 14 was a portrait of Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia by Dmitry Levitsky, whose dates are 1735 to 1822. Together with the portrait, there was a letter of Catherine the Great to Count Pyotr Alexandrovich Rumyantsov, outlining her inoculation strategy against smallpox. The two items sold for 951,000. Pounds, if that's of any interest. This sale was the, the trigger or the impetus for my talk tonight. Stay with me and eventually I'll get to William Blake. It'll take me a while, but I'll get there. But first, there's a story to be told. Catherine is depicted in this portrait as the lawgiver in the Temple of Justice half length, wearing the tiniest crown with a laurel wreath behind her head and the ribbons to the most important Russian decorations. Levitsky created some 20 images of the Empress, although there's no evidence to suggest that Catherine ever posed for him personally. In keeping with a practice that was widespread at the time, the painter used earlier portraits by the Austrian Johann but this Lampy, the elder, as templates when working on his compositions. Levitsky, nevertheless, has managed quite strikingly to represent a real person and not merely copy the template offered to him. The Empress looks more youthful than in Lampy's canvases. The modeling of the face has been slightly altered and its oval shape softened. The figurative treatment made less formal and the monarch's lips have taken on a restrained half smile. But of greater significance to us today is Catherine's letter on inoculation against smallpox. The letter was signed by her on 20th of April, 1787, and contains an instruction to Count Brumyantsev in Kiev as governor general and vice regent of Malorossiya, Little Russia, the name for Ukraine used in official documents of Tsarist Russia, to treat smallpox, smallpox inoculation in the province as one of the main duties of his position, so that, as I quoted in my title, such inoculation should be common everywhere. Smallpox epidemic, well, I know that amongst my viewers tonight are a couple of Russian speakers, so I'm leaving these slides out. So all, all I can read is the bold signature, Yekaterina. But uh, smallpox epidemics ravaged Europe in the 18th century and often claimed the lives of entire villages. It is said that in one year in the second half of the 18th century, two million people died of smallpox in Russia. Smallpox began with high fever, and severe vomiting, followed by a skin rash. The victim were next, next developed sores 
which eventually scabbed over and fell off, scarring the skin. About three out of 10 of those infected died, and the survivors were typically badly scarred for life, sometimes even blinded or permanently disabled. Scars with, uh, from earlier encounters with the disease covered the bodies and faces of people in all social classes. Indeed, Catherine's future husband, Grand Duke Piotr Fedorovich, later Tsar Peter II, fell victim to smallpox just before their wedding and was left permanently disfigured. This 1787 letter predates Edward Jenner's medical breakthrough of vaccination by cowpox vaccination from cows by nearly 10 years. Before Jenna, European physicians followed Turkish practice in relying upon variolation. That variola, variola is Latin for smallpox, a deliberate infection with a mild form of the disease. While those who received the treatment did go on to develop common smallpox and symptoms like fever and rash, the death toll following variolation was significantly lower. Typically, mortality after inoculation by the variolation method was 2%, some 20 times less than from natural infection. But the risk remained, and there were many opponents of variolation. The Empress herself and the heir to the throne, Grand Duke Paul, had been inoculated against smallpox. Some 20 years before she wrote this letter in 1787. But the task of inoculating the population of the empire remained incomplete and was still meeting with resistance on the ground. Before her own inoculation, Catherine had confessed in a letter to another enlightened despot, Frederick the Great of Prussia, and I quote, ever since my childhood, I was aware of the horror of smallpox. And at a more mature age, it took a great deal of effort to alleviate that horror. Last spring, when the disease was rampant here, I used to run from house to house, not wanting to endanger my son or myself. I was so struck by the vileness of such a situation, I considered a weakness not to avoid it. I was advised to inoculate my son against smallpox. I used to reply that it would be shameful not to start with myself. And how could I introduce smallpox variolation without setting the personal example? I began to study the subject. Should I remain in real danger together with thousands of people throughout my life? Or should I prefer a lesser danger, a very brief one, and so save many people? I thought that by choosing the latter, I was selecting the best course. This is a portrait of Dr. Tom. On the advice, of the then Russian ambassador in London, an English doctor, here we have him, Thomas Dimsdale, who had a high reputation in the field of smallpox inoculation, and an exceptionally low mortality rate, was invited by Catherine to travel to Russia and inoculate herself and her son. Accordingly, Dimsdale and his second son, Nathaniel, at the time still a medical student in Edinburgh, who served as his, as his assistant, attended Catherine in St. Petersburg in 1768 and inoculated the Empress, her son, and over 140 members of the court. But such was the anxiety surrounding the event, the Empress arranged for relays of post horses to be ready to carry the two men rapidly to safety should the inoculation produce adverse effects, incurring the wrath of the Russian people. So us, in October 1768, Catherine started the preparatory diet and medicinal treatment. Dimsdale harvested the contents of a smallpox pustule from the young son of a sergeant major and used it to inoculate the empress. Horace Walpole gives a gossipy account in a letter, 2nd December 1768, to his friend Horace Mann in Florence. Here we go. We have a new Russian ambassador to be magnificence itself, his wonderfully civil and copious of words. He treated me t'other night with a pompous relation of his sovereign ladies, that is Catherine's heroism. I never doubted her courage. She sent for Dr. Dimsdale, would have no trial made on any person of her own age and corpulence, went into the country with her usual company, 
swore Dimsdale to secrecy, and you may swear he kept his oath to, to such a lioness. She was inoculated, dined, supped, and walked out in public, and never disappeared but one day. A few eruptions on her face, and many on her body, which last, I suppose, she swore Orlov, that's her lover, Count Grigori, Grigorievich Orlov, likewise not to tell. She has now inoculated herself. I wonder she did not, out of magnanimity, try the experiment on him first. The Empress was inoculated secretly in the night between Sunday and Monday of the 13th of October. Everything turned out well. And after a week of mild discomfort, the Empress's recovery was triumphantly announced on the 29th of October. Her son was inoculated soon after. The Synod and the Senate sent greetings to Catherine, and on 21st of November, 1768, and was, was declared a day of celebration in Russia to honor Her Imperial Majesty's magnanimous, unparalleled, and illustrious deed. <coughs> Dimsdale, who, and this is, I think, is the miniature in the National Portrait Gallery. Dimsdale was rewarded with the rank of Baron of the Empire, Councillor of State, and position to the Empress, besides a reward of £10,000, serious money, a pension of £500 per annum, and £2,000 expenses. His son Nathaniel shared the honours. He too received the barony and was also presented by the Empress with a gold snuff box set with diamonds. And the convalescent six-year-old Alexander Markov, the donor of infected lymph for the Empress, returned to hospital where he made a full recovery and was later himself ennobled for his services. His crest, an arm bearing a rose in the hand and an inoculation incision. Catherine wrote in a letter to Count Chernushov, that now Russian ambassador in London, starting with me and my son, who is also recovering. There is no noble house to which there are not several inoculated persons, and many regret they had smallpox naturally, and so cannot be fashionable. Count Orlov, Count Vasilovsky, and countless others have passed through Mr. Dimsdale's hands, and even renowned beauties. Here is what example. Unfortunately, the fashionability of, amongst the nobility of being inoculated against smallpox did not trickle down to the Russian population at large, particularly in the outer regions of the empire. The Empress's letter of 1787 shows again the problem of smallpox inoculation in the outlying parts of the empire was still acute and called for administrative intervention and supervision. On his return to it, Dimsdale was elected a feather, fellow of the Royal Society, and sometime after this, Dr. or Baron Dimsdale, as he's now called, opened a banking house, Cornhill, with presumably all his surplus money, in partnership with his sons and other relatives. Although he himself retired from the firm in 1776, the business was continued by his descendants. I think it ended up really as part of that West, but that took a lot of uh, amalgamations. Although he, uh, the success then of the Dimsdale Bank rested on its appeal to clientele, which was largely upper middle class, non-conformist, and often related by blood or marriage to partners. This is, this is Dimsdale in old age. In 1780, he was elected Member of Parliament for the Borough of Hartford, after which he declined all medical practice except for the relief of the poor. He went once more, however, to Russia in 1781, when he inoculated Catherine's grandchildren, the Princess Alexander and Constantine. He was re-elected to Parliament in 1784, but did not stand in 1790, and was succeeded by his son, Nathaniel. Dimsdale died at Hartford on 30th of December, 1800, aged 89, very good age. He came from a long line of, of Quaker medical men. 
His grandfather, Robert Dimsdale Surgeon, had accompanied William Penn on a visit to America in 1684. Uh, Dimsdale himself was interred in the Quaker burial ground at Bishop Stortford. Nathaniel himself died in 1811, with no male heir and his Russian title lapsed. The barony awarded his father, whoever descended by his eldest son, John, 1747 to 1820, to succeeding generations. The current Baron Dimsdale is Edward, the 10th Baron. In 1767, Dimsdale had published an important treatise on variolation. It's a rather long title. The present method of inoculating from smallpox, to which are added some experiments instituted with a view to discover the effects of a similar treatment in the natural smallpox. This was a work that became very popular and in the course of three years, ran through at least seven large editions. It was translated into Russian, of course, in 1770. Dimsdale's work on smallpox inoculation was not original, but it built on the achievements of an Essex family named Sutton, who, despite the absence of any formal medical qualifications, had achieved outstanding success with their techniques. This consisted of a two to three week preparatory diet and drug preparation, followed by a puncture of the skin with a lancet dipped, to use their own description, in the smallest possible quantity of the unripe crude or watery matter from the pustules from a patient suffering from disease. The incision, one in each arm, was minute. It was not to exceed one eighth of an inch in length or one sixteenth of an inch in depth. The Suttons operated an inoculation house at Ingatestone in Essex. They inoculated about 17,000 persons, with only five or six fatalities. Without acknowledging the Suttons by name, Dimsdale, through his publication, established the Suttonian method as the standard method of inoculation for smallpox. So what has all this to do with William Blake? In February 17, no, in February 1956, Sotheby's sold at auction Blake's first book of Urizen. Identified as copy A, it was formerly in the possession of Major T. E. Dimsdale, the eighth baron. It was acquired by Paul Mellon and given by Mellon to the Yale Center for British Art in 1992. Move on. This copy, originally printed 17. Oh, remains one of the most striking, I think, as well as the most complete versions of Book Wirrison. The Sotheby's catalogue cites a family tradition that the first Baron Dimsdale had acquired the book directly from Blake. It had previously been issued in Colourfax Simile in 1929 with an accompanying book by Dorothy Plowman. You can probably still, up, still pick up a reasonably priced copy of the, of the facsimile on AB Books. Um, oh yeah, that's it. Previously, in 1952, Sotheby's had sold a fragmentary copy, copy or called Copy R, of Blake's Songs of Innocence. Again, the family tradition reported in the catalogue cites the original purchaser as the first Baron Dimsdale. This copy of Innocence shows some signs of fire damage. It was acquired by Geoffrey Keynes and bequeathed by him to the Fitzwilliam Museum in 1985. The museum notes that this copy was printed and colored circa 1794, though Joseph Viscomi suggests a later date of production. I think the 1794 makes sense to me because it's very lightly watercolored. You look at later uh, copies of Innocence and they're much more richly colored than this. Anyway, <clears throat> another fragmentary copy of Innocence copy Y, as again fire damage, was acquired by a German collector and is on loan to the Valraff Richards Museum in Cologne. It's now clear that these two fragmented copies, once formed single copy, copy RY, was presumably broken up while in the Dimsdale family, perhaps at the time of, or because of the fire damage. It may also be the earliest example of a 
Blake illuminated book decorated with gold leaf. Not not in this page, but in other pages. Most recently, Sotheby's, 17th of December, 1984, sold as lot 318, the complaint and the consolation on night thoughts, 43 pictorial, pictorial borders designed and engraved by William Blake and colored by hand, 1797. Inscribed on the verse of the title page in pencil in the upper left-hand corner is Baron Dimsdale. It was sold to the dealers, Sims Reed and Fogg, for £13,750. The dealers then sold it to an anonymous collector for £20,000, so quite a substantial markup there. It is now listed as copy X of the Coloured Night Thoughts. Bentley suggests that Blake was given copies of the Night Thoughts to colour as part payment for his work. The coloured engravings would have been sold directly to Blake's patrons. There's that's a, as you could grasp, there's a Dimsdale Providence for the book of Hurison, copy A, Songs of Innocence, copy R, stroke Y, and a hand colored, colored copy of Young's Night Thoughts, copy X. This surely is a, is a significant Blake collection, almost certainly bought directly from the poet painter, and the strong evidence of at least acquaintanceship and probable friendship between Blake and the first Baron Dimsdale. I have to add at this point that, of course, Thomas and Nathaniel Dimsdale were both the first baron of separate creations. That doesn't really alter the picture of a strong link between Blake and the Dimsdales. It's puzzling to me that so little has been written about the Blake Dimsdale connection. I suppose really that Blake's friendship with a fashionable society physician, banker, and member of parliament doesn't fit the standard picture that puts Blake firmly within the circle of Joseph Johnston, what Richard Cobb dismissed as a mere bunch of misfits, cranks, dreamers, and dissenting radicals. Dimsdale is a Quaker, and the Friends London Meeting for Sufferings had first petitioned Parliament against the slave trade in 1783. He is one of the initially small group of MPs who supported the society for the purpose of effecting the abolition of the slave trade from its inception in 1787. And also as a member of parliament, the Quaker Dimsdale consistently voted against the Pitt government's war plans. Unlike the, the Johnson circle we just talked about it, Dimsdale was actively trying to do something. So were, Catherine, were William and Catherine Blake inoculated? I'm tempted to think they must have been. Don, Dr. Dimsdale, as friend and patron, would surely have encouraged it. Indeed, I suggest, and I suspect, maybe approaching Dr. Dimsdale for inoculation was the occasion of their, their meeting and the start of their friendship. I like the thought that an obscure physician in Hertfordshire had inoculated both Catherine Blake and the Empress Catherine of Russia. Dimsdale had lived to see the publication in 1798 of Jenner's work on vaccination, which initially led to an unseemly conflict between supporters of virulation and supporters of vaccination until the latter eventually triumphed and put an end to the practice. This is Gilray's The Cowpox or the Wonderful Effects of the Inoculation. Gilray here satirizes the anti vaccination who support <laughs> pretending, I suppose, that they, 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 they thought that vaccination with cowpox will lead to an eruption of cows. And you see there's a, on the right, the man with a cow coming out of his bottom uh, and so on. Um, I have seen this Gilray uh, satire. <laughs> With the suggestion that it's an that it's anti-vaccination. And I think no, it's absurd. It's satirizing the anti-vaccination movement. But as always with Gilray, it's a very subtle man. All sorts of things going on in this. Ah, finally, 
is there any representation of smallpox in Blake's work? Um, consider book of Job, chapter two, verse seven. So went Satan forth from his presence of the Lord, from the, so, sorry, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. There is a long history of medical Job traditions. There was the St. Job Hospital in Utrecht from the 16th century. Hamburg had a St. Job's Hospital specifically for smallpox patients, founded in 1505. Another such hospital was established near the Church of St. Job there in Venice. Here we have Hans von Gerstorff's Feldbuch der Wunderarztei, Field Manual for Wound Doctors of 1532. It's mostly drawings of real wounds and how to treat them, but there are these symbolic images, which is that during this image of Job, his wife, and a hovering Satan. I don't know if Blake could have seen this, but it includes all the elements of the traditional iconography of Job on his dung heap with sores, very like the sores of smallpox on his body. Let's now turn to Blake's illustrations of the book of Job, page six, Satan smiting Job oils, where he makes He's made significant changes to the traditional iconography. The smallpox pustules are barely visible. Satan is no longer a monstrous cockatrice, but a heroic nude, given the halo that tells you he's angelic, but with his genitals scaled over. In the lower border is an earthenware pot from which a fragment has been broken, doubtless to be used by Job to scrape himself with in his agony to relieve the pain. Job chapter two, verse eight, and he took him a pot shard to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. I now move on to another possible instance, and that's on plate 29 of Jerusalem, which the lines I'm interested read. Or cruel pity, or dark deceit, can love seek for dominion? And Lufa strove to gather dominion over Albion. They strove together above the body where Bala was enclosed, and the dark body of Albion left prostrate upon the crystal pavement, covered with boils from head to foot, the terrible smitings of Lufa. Th these lines are repeated in Night the Third of Bala. Now, a foster damon reads this passage as implying that Albion is covered <coughs> with syphilitic souls. However, the words clearly echo the book of Job's soul boils from the soul of his foot unto his crown, where the tradition is of smallpox. Syphilis, smallpox, I think we leave that question to another occasion. Thank you. There we are. Thank you very much, Kerry. A, a wonderful talk. May I open it up to questions? And I think our first question, I thought I saw Susan Blake's hand raised, but um, no, thanks, Tim. It was just applause. Okay. Thank you. So applause for, for Kerry. No question, but just to say that was fascinating, Kerry. Thank you so much and so topical, so interesting. I love the connection all the way back to Catherine the Great. Wonderful. Thank you. I deliberately avoided uh, bringing out any contemporary parallels, but I, I think that they're, they're, they're obvious to, to everyone. Yeah. We have a question from John Reardon. 
Hello, am I unmuted? Yeah, um, again, it's not really a question, I'm afraid. It's just to say absolutely fascinating. Um, but also um, lovely for me to discover that um, Dr. Slash Baron Dimsdale um, was buried in my hometown of Bishop's Dortford. Uh, I had no idea there even was a Quaker burial ground there. So that was a, a, a treat for me. Well, go and find it. And... <laughs> I must. I must. <laughs> Yes, I, I deeply. I used to have a friend who lived in Bishop Stalford, and I didn't know about this. And I, I deeply regret I never insisted on going to Quaker burial ground. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just having a look on, um, at the end of your speech on on uh, Google Maps to try and find it. I think it might be something else now, but so uh, yeah, I might hop on a train and go and have a look at some start sometime soon. Colin Addy. Uh, Kerry, uh, th thanks, thanks for that. Fascinating, really interesting. Um, it's a little bit sort of um, off the wall, but on sort of on topic. Um, I recall a long, long time ago at a, um, at a meeting or being at Westminster Archives, reading something somewhere about a reference that um, William Blake encouraged um, or tried to organize uh, Catherine um, getting some electrical treatment, some new electrical treatment or something. Does that, does that ring any bells with you? And is, yeah, it, sort yeah. of, uh, is it also sort of related to, you know, Blake's um, uh, interest in what I suppose at the time was called modern medicine? This, I, if I recall rightly, the electrical treatment is from the Felfenkers. Was it? And, yeah. And I get, I'm beginning to get, get the impression that William Haley was the really enthusiast for right. do it yourself medicine. Um, right. Hey, hey the, 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 uh, I didn't have no time to include, but Haley, uh, Haley's letters, you learned that when he was living at Eartham, he inoculated. The whole household. Um, in fact, reading the letter, he doesn't mention a third party, so I rather think he did it himself with the aid of Dr. Dimsdale's treaties. <laughs> yeah, so it's. Hey, hey, well, yeah. guy with the, elect the electrical machines were popular but expensive. If you go to the Wesley Museum just across the road from from Bunhill Fields, they have Wesley's electrical machine. Wesley was very keen on electrical treatment. Right, right. It was, now, a, sort of it was a, bit, a bit of an aside, but uh, you know, it sort of prompted me to remember that. Thanks anyway. Thank you, Colin. And we have a, another hand raised from Philomene. Thank you again, Kerry. That was totally fascinating. My question is, do the documents that you were consulting for this give any details as to these preparatory diets they all had to follow before being inoculated? Uh, I haven't looked far enough. I mean, I, but this, is, this, is, this is less than six weeks work. So uh, <coughs> I've only just dipped very, very shallowly into this. Yes, what, what the diets were, I'm not sure. They tended oh. to vary from doctor to doctor what they thought was appropriate. Yes. Well, the idea that you have to prepare your body for the uh, addition of, of a foreign organism, which is what this essentially is, is actually rather good and mm. uh, worthy of, of contemporary medicine perhaps having a look at. Mm. Anyway, it's super, super interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. A very quick question from the chair, which is probably unfair. Did you discover how Dinsdale became a doctor? It was often said that Quakers were denied access to the professions, and I just wondered if you knew how he became a doctor. Well, he... Mm, well, he was from a long line of Quaker doctors, so obviously there wasn't much preventing Quakers becoming doctors. His father 
encouraged him initially to, well, it, in England, it wasn't a university profession. So you, you, you would just go to a particular hospital as, as more or less an apprentice. Then later in life, um, Dimsdale, I think got an MD from Aberdeen, and certainly from a Scottish university. So it's not an university profession in England, but it is a university study in, 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 in Edinburgh. And yeah, because his son went to Edinburgh. So, oh. It's from this long line of doctors. Yeah. Everyone, we're coming to the end of our time. Hmm. I'd like to, on behalf of the Blake Society, thank Dr. Kerry Davies for a wonderful talk. It was truly fascinating. And in the space of a week, I've come across two references to Russia and Blake. Tonight, of course, with the link from Catherine the Great to William Blake. But also at the great conference last week on Global Blake, we heard that the first place outside England where Blake's books arrived on the continent was not Germany, but was indeed Russia. And so it's, um, Russia has suddenly come into the Blake world twice in a week with very significant stories. So our thanks to Kerry, our thanks to everyone tonight to attend, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event in February, which will be on Blake and Blade Runner. So good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.